welcome everyone to I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist. And Troy, I'm going to throw straight to you so you feel loved, you feel included. How are you going? Yeah, I feel good because you often forget me, don't you? Actually, actually, that's not true. You haven't forgotten me in a really long time. So, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm happy. I went out last night to a friend's pizza party. His friend, my friend, excuse me, his son is a chef and he did these pizzas and it was just that sort of gourmet pizza. And I don't know about you, but the little bit of the brain which tells you when to stop eating for me doesn't work with pizza and nachos. So I reckon I ate a whole large pizza to myself. It's pretty evident that part of my brain doesn't work also. When you said I went to a pizza party, I sort of, my mind went back to youth group. I thought, fuck, it sounds like Troy went to like a youth group pizza night and um, I, I got slightly triggered. And can I just clarify before we go on, was it the youth group pizza night that you're just dressing up to sound gourmet? No, no, it was, you know, that sort of corporate colleague pizza party it was lovely. It was really, really nice. They're lovely people and we had a good time, but the pizza was amazing because as I said, the son was a chef and he did these amazing pizzas and he had his own pizza oven outside. They live on a lake. I felt all very grown up. It was the furthest thing from a youth group pizza party you could ever have. I, I don't drink anymore. Everyone else did. And they all seemed to be having a really good time. And I had those overpriced non-alcoholic beers, so I didn't feel completely left out. It was a good time. And that concludes Cooking Tips with Brian and Troy for this week. So, but Troy, I'm going to throw to you to introduce our guests. We have a return guest and somebody who was sort of on the podcast last time by default because he sits with our guests. So I'm going to let you talk about our guest today. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to today's chat. Yeah, so am I. So first of all, we've got John Wright. He's a documentary filmmaker freelance cinematographer and media content producer originally from Belfast, Northern Ireland, although you can't hear that anymore, who now lives and works in Arizona and California. He's a keen interest in exploring people's beliefs and why they hold them. His work includes documentaries on various subjects, such as the story of evangelical preacher Tony Campolo and his son, Bart Campolo, and their, well, Bart's departure from Christianity and, and their relationship after that. So, John Wright, first for you, welcome to I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist. Hey, glad to be here. And our second guest, just mentioned him a moment ago, Bart Campolo. You may remember him from earlier uh, episodes. I feel like Troy McClure. I'm Troy McClure. You might remember me from such episodes as Bart Campolo. Bart Campolo is an American humanist speaker, writer, and former pastor. He is the son of Tony Campolo, well-known Christian pastor and speaker. After a cycling accident in 2011, Bart transitioned from Christianity to secular humanism. He served as the first humanist chaplain at the University of Southern California and engaging in public speaking and writing on topics related to humanism and religion. I hope I got that all right, Bart Campolo. Welcome to I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist. Well, thank you so much. And, and all of that is right to a point. There's so much more to say about myself. Um, <laughs> joking. Well, actually, I, you know, I guess the whole point of these podcasts is there's always more to say about all of ourselves, right? I, I agree. There's there's plenty more, but the question is, which bits do the audience want to listen to? Yes, that's been our learning of late, hasn't it? Which <laughs> bits do the uh, audience want to listen to? Hey, I've got a question for both of you. We ask this of everyone. It's like, um, what's her name? Krista Tippett, who asks, tell me about your, we ask, were you a teenage fundamentalist? Bart? Absolutely was. 15 years old, came to Jesus. And uh, like, I was fundamentalist about I guess I was just a fundamentalist, you know, like the fact that I had a social justice heart because, you know, I grew up in that world didn't stop me from like using a knife to cut my hand every time I masturbated because I believed that the Bible said that if your hand causes you to sin, you should cut it off. And I thought that this way I would, this would really discipline me into stopping. So I think Hold when it, you're is cut that true, is that true? Did you actually cut your hand? Yeah, that's a true, that's a true story. Yeah. Yeah. Many times. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I guess that's it. That tells you I masturbated a lot too. Yeah. You could have a website, you know, you could have a website for that. People would pay. But like, what's funny is like, in, in all seriousness, like you guys are sort of asking because it's your shtick, but like a lot of people are like, were you really a Christian? I don't think you ever really believed. And I'm like, baby, when that's you're- That's the only example you need. 
that. <laughs> when you when you when you get a pen knife and you're cutting your wrist at two o'clock in the morning because you 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 masturbated, uh, you you believe you you believe. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty teenage fundamentally for sure. It's very fun. You know, fundy is fundy, and that that's fundy. Yeah, it's also one hell of a kink. Well, and we throw Sue Bart's OnlyFans page. Um, John Wright, were you a teenage fundamentalist? I was. One of the very uh, many things that Bart and I have in common is that our fathers are, were both preachers. And so my dad was a Presbyterian minister, and I grew up in that world as well. And so, yes, I absolutely was. I don't have any stories like that that I can think of. But John, by the time you were a teenager, you had you were no longer in your dad's stodgy Presbyterian church. You were part of the like the biggest mega church in Belfast, right? Oh, that's right. It was very it was very charismatic. Tr- traditionalists didn't didn't love us and and that kind of thing. But it was still fundamentalism. During revivals and stuff, quite often people talk about seeing angels and things like that. At a church in Belfast, do you see leprechauns during <laughs> revival? That's a good question. Uh, I had never seen a leprechaun uh, in that context or any other, but I did really love that church and that life. I mean, I thought I had a good time in charismatic Christianity. You know, you never knew what was going to happen, and it was always very exciting. And so I have no, I actually have no bad stories to tell <laughs> from that period of my life because I just, uh, I was having a good time. But then I was also, it's the age you are, you're coming of age. You know, in my very early 20s, was playing in, in the worship bands and stuff like that and having a grand old time. Yeah. You say you didn't know what was going to happen, right? But actually you did because there was going to be an offering and there was going to be songs. and <laughs> that. That's true. There was a format, but my church was known for like this 45 minutes of sort of freewheeling, you know, anyone could come up and speak and that kind of thing, even though there's a room of thousand people, you know, so it, it was interesting that way. You know, John, I, I never told you, sir, I was at a wedding once at a charismatic wedding and there was a time where they sort of allowed anyone that wanted to, to bless the couple. And so people came up and laid hands on them and this guy started speaking in tongues Uh huh. And, and then, and then he just started prophesying in English, but like, he was like, he was speaking, you know, and this will happen and that will happen and you will be blessed and the fruit of your loom will be rest and the fruit of your loom. <laughs> and like, he, he was supposedly speaking for God, but God was saying fruit of the loom, the underwear instead of fruit of your womb. And and I just thought it, it was so incongruous to me. That's like the greatest. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's so. great. Oh, bless. Hashtag bless. That's lovely. Hey, so Today, what we want to do with you guys, if that's okay, is we want to talk to you about life after church, right? But before we do, can we just ask you a couple of questions about what led to your loss of faith? How did you come to a point where you really walked away? And then from there, we want to springboard into what's it been like for you since leaving? So maybe starting with you, John, what led to your loss of faith? You know, it's so funny that you ask this because I'm not sure I've ever really been asked or told it before, even to you, Bart. Like, because I what what started re- really with when when I met Bart. This is fast forwarding a lot of years. I was telling his story within within days of meeting you, Bart. I was telling your story, and not my own. And I'm not sure that there's much to tell. Is the is the real truth? Like, it, it's a very similar. Partly the reason Bart and I became friends and sort of got along so well is because I recognized in his story a lot of my own, my own thing. And the way that I portrayed it in the film that you mentioned earlier is with a Jenga, a block of Jenga, that game Jenga, the wooden block game where you take a piece out one at a time, you know, and then eventually the whole thing comes down. And I, in my mind, when I did that, it was a reflection of my own story. It was, it was a little bit at a time, you know, it was uh, one piece. I was never, I would say I was never someone who accepted the, the wisdom I was handed for better and for worse. You know, there are times in life where it might have been better to, you know, to, to really like listen to my elders and like you know, really understand what they were saying. But I had just enough of that sort of like preacher's kid rebellion thing to be questioning everything. And I'm sure I drove my dad crazy because I had, you know, questions about everything that he would say and every, everything that uh, I was being handed. And so there's a process that over m- many years and um, where I will agree with Bart's dad, Tony, who is also in my film about the two of them, 
is that there was a sort of a sociological component to this as well. I moved away from all the Christians I grew up with, moved to a fairly secular part of the United States. And in the process of doing that, I think it becomes very easy to leave behind things that you might not have, you know, you might not have thought explicitly about. And so I don't know what I would be now if I had stayed in Northern Ireland. It's a very religious place, Northern Ireland. Belfast is a very religious town, but I, I, I suspect that I wouldn't have left it quite as quickly as I did. And so did you come to a point one day where you went, I don't believe this anymore, I'm done, or did it just creep up on you? How did it all happen? I, I heard you about Jenga, but I'm just curious if there was actually a... There, there wasn't a, a dramatic moment, yeah. I think partly what it was is like when you do move away from, and, and no longer was I going to church, right? Like I looked for a church that was like the one that I had in Belfast and there was nothing even remotely liked it. Like it. I didn't like any of the things that I found really. And so I was kind of like, well, maybe I've moved just enough along at this point that I am comfortable sort of leaving this behind. And then I think from there, it's only a matter of months until you sort of go like, what do I believe exactly? Probably not this. Yeah. Now, Pat, I just want to clarify, you were with us a couple of years ago and we did speak about this, but as much as we can't believe this also, a lot of our listeners haven't listened to all of our episodes. So can you just walk us through a bit? You, you described your loss of faith as a death of a thousand cuts. So there's many, many things over the years which led to it. But again, if you were to summarise it, what did it look like for you and how did it play out, you losing your faith? You know, it's, it's interesting to listen to John, you know, because what's funny is I hear echoes of my dad sort of saying like, you need to stay within a plausibility structure. And what he meant was like, if you're in church and everyone around you is confirming your narrative on a weekly basis, you're not as prone to question it. It's, you know, so it's like the first step for you, John, was when you like moved and then all of a sudden you weren't surrounded by people that were supporting you. And the truth is, as I was listening to you, I was like, I don't know if you'd have ever gotten out if you'd have stayed there only because like me, I had a great time being a Christian. Like I became a Christian in high school as part of a big youth group. It gave me a sense of identity, a sense of mission and purpose, uh, you know, kind of immediate friendship. And like, I never got hurt in church. Like in my real life, like the thing I do for money now is I'm a licensed clinical counselor. And, and I also coach people around the world that meet me through the podcast that John and I have been making for the last seven or eight years. And I coach people that are going through religious transitions. But in both cases, a lot of people's deconversion stories are wrapped up around like I was gay and they made me feel like I was nothing or I was a woman and I was shunted aside and I was told to submit or a pastor with a kind of a megalomania construct in his head like really hurt me and put me down and made me feel like I needed to like I was I was evil and wrong or like. I never had any of that stuff. Nobody ever hurt me. I, I was, it was good times all the way. But the difference was, is that where my faith took me was being an inner city youth worker and then an inner city street worker in Cincinnati. And when I got to Cincinnati and I was doing this inner city stuff, I stopped going to church. I was writing Christian newsletters and I was traveling around the country, preaching in churches and preaching at youth events and, and being celebrated for my faith. But on, on a daily basis, I was in the street working with poor people and there was nothing to confirm my faith in that world. And there was a lot that made me think that there wasn't a God. There was a lot to suggest that there was not an all loving God who was in charge of what was going on and who answered prayers. And that's where the death of a thousand cuts starts to come in. It's like, you know, I'm back at street level and I'm praying for really basic stuff, like stuff any nice God would want to do. Like I wasn't praying like, give me a Lamborghini and make me famous. I was like, there's this girl in my neighborhood and she's getting raped by her uncle on a pretty regular basis. Could you protect her or help me get her out of that situation? And then like, no, I can't. And there's no legal way to get her out. And she's going to stay there. And he keeps, and you just go like, I, I'm not sure there's anyone in charge. I, I'm not sure any of this stuff makes any sense. No, undermined, undermined. Totally undermined. The idea, yeah. And that's before you get into like, you know, I read the Bible and this passage doesn't line up with that passage. And I realized that, you know, all these different Christians are quoting the same scripture and they are all coming up with the very different gods and very, you know, like like all the, all the normal stuff that everybody goes through. But for me, 
it really was kind of this stuff doesn't work at street level. And, and, and the other thing interesting was when I got to Cincinnati and I was doing this work, there came a point at which I had been running a very large nonprofit that I needed to raise a lot of money. So I needed to write a lot of Christian newsletters. And then I was working at this very small street level scale and I could make it all the money I needed just giving talks. So I stopped having to write letters, but I kept writing them. So all of a sudden I was writing newsletters about what was happening in my life, but I didn't need to get any money out of them. And the content and the tone of those letters changed so fast it would make your head spin. And I was suddenly telling stories about like kids I couldn't save and things that didn't go right mm -hmm. and ways that God didn't show up. And people were writing to me going, what's going on with you, man? You, these, these letters, my, my dad was like, oh, these letters, you, if people read these, they're going to think you don't believe in God anymore. And I realized, you know, in a, in a sense, it was a little bit like that Upton Sinclair quote, you know, that it's very difficult to change a person's mind about something if their salary depends upon them not changing it. And for the first time in my life, my salary didn't depend on me putting out the party line. And so all of a sudden I started asking questions that I had wisely not asked before, because if I asked them, it could endanger the whole enterprise. And it wasn't long, you know, it was a matter of year, a couple of years, you know, and the bike accident, people sometimes think the bike accident is what caused it. It isn't the bike accident is what caused me to face up to it. I, you know, I, I had a brain injury and for a num about a month, I couldn't think straight and I wasn't myself. And then when I recovered my sense of self, I was like, oh, like my brain is, in, you know, my identity is in my head. I'm not a, like, I am not an embodied spirit. Like I, like it's up here in my brain. And when this brain breaks down, I'll be dead. I was talking to my wife about that. And she was like, listen, man, you got to get out of this Christian thing. There's nothing left. You don't believe any of it. It's interesting you bring up the bike accident because whatever many degrees of separation, I've actually got a friend of mine who's quite close to your dad, Bart. And he said to me when we were talking one day, and he's still in church, and he said to me, Tony seems to think it's probably the bike accident and something happened to Bart. Now, I'm not saying that that's really what your dad said. This is just what this other person said to me. And I thought, well, see, there's the narrative. They're basically saying, oh, yeah, the reason why Bart fell away is because, you know, something happened to his brain, right? And it's like, and I'm, I, I, even I sat there at the time going, no, I don't think it's that, come on. But, but there you go, right? The narrative is, no, there wasn't anything wrong with the faith. It was Bart's brain. And I don't want to break anybody's bubble about preachers out there, but like what a preacher says and what a preacher actually believes are not always the same thing. And saying it was the bike accident really worked for my dad in terms of talking to Christian friends. And, and it's very embarrassing when your son very publicly leaves the faith. I mean, and I, I didn't actually leave it publicly. People, like I was out at USC doing my little thing and somebody found out and wrote a big article about me. And then all of a sudden it was a big news story for people in, in this country because my dad's such a big deal. But yeah, when I talked to him back when he was sort of able to have really cogent conversations about this stuff, he said, you know, I. I, saw, I should have seen this coming. You became a universalist. You started doing gay weddings. You stopped going to church. You know, you, you stopped you, reading certain authors and started reading other ones. Yeah. 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 He's like, I should have seen it coming. It's what happens when you step outside the covering, isn't it, Bart? Unbelievable. And, and this is what we, we often talk about, you know, that reinforcing bubble. And I know it's something you've spoken about a lot as well. And once you step outside of that bubble or are given some license to do so, you're able to start to deal with that cognitive dissonance that you've you've employed for for so long. But don't knock the bubble, Brian, because like in my life now, you know, it's funny, like when I got to USC, all these people and John, like we became friends when I was out there and there were all these people on that campus that thought that I was there because I was going to try to break all these Christians out of their bubble. Like that was my job as the humanist chaplain. And I was like, I'm not touching any of those people. Like half this campus doesn't believe in God. I'm trying to evangelize those people to live as though this life is the only one that they have and make the most of it. But the Christians I left alone because the truth of the matter is, is if I pull somebody out of their bubble, I don't have a, like a lovely ready-made fellowship group for them. I don't have like a pastoral caregiver for them. I don't have a bunch of songs for them to sing. And so like, if they're a lonely person or if they're maybe socially awkward or if they, they, they got troubles in their family, like they may need that bubble. That bubble may be what's holding them together. 
And you go, but you don't think any of it's true. And I go like, ah, but it helps. Some people, it really helps. And so, I, you know, I, you, there's nothing left of my supernatural credulity, but until I have a better community to offer people, I am very loath to piss on theirs. The only people I try to rescue from Christianity are the ones that Christianity is grinding up already. And, and they are legion. I'm sorry, did I screw, did I screw up the podcast there? <laughs> Not at all. It's very biblical. I was just, it was a, a Sela moment when you mentioned legion. So it's just like a- so much goddamn Christianese going on here, right? It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's Legion and Sela. And- I don't live in that country anymore, but I still speak the language and I still have the accent. <laughs> it's like John and, and, and you guys joke about John's Belfast accent being gone, but like if you get him a little bit drinking or if you get him a little bit angry, like you can get right back. It's it's to the bone. If my dad called me right now, I'd be like, oh, what about you? What's going on, mucker? You know, yeah. So it's like very, very quick. Yeah. Very, very good. And that's how I am about the Holy Spirit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can still hear the twang there, John. A little bit. It's a little bit there. And being Australians, we love the Irish, don't we? Because we've all got bits of Irish in us. I've noticed this. There, There is a bit of a Commonwealth sort of thing that happens among, you know, various people. Like if I run into Canadian, we've got some Canadian friends here in Arizona, and it's the same sort of thing. It's like there's something slightly like, Let's just say non-American about it. And it's, it is a little bit of a, a bond. When you start to say Commonwealth, I thought you were going to say convict. I thought you were <laughs> going there. And I thought you were going to call it for what it is. And we're okay with that because you find Australians quite often, we're trying to look through back through our past and find a link to convicts. It's a little bit of a badge of honour down here for some, <laughs> for some. Very much. You know, I was in a bar in China and there was, it was an Irish pub and there was an Irish band and they were singing, heave away you ruler, kings were born for South Australia. And I was looking at them and I was thinking, for us, this is a song of joy and happiness. And, but for them, it was like, uh, you know, it was an ode to trauma wow. because it was like, wow. they were being, and I, seriously. And I was like, wow, we used to sing bound for South Australia, which is, you know, an Irish song about being carted away from your family. We used to sing it with smiles and, yeah, we're all going to Adelaide, you know. <laughs> and it wasn't until I was there. Seriously, I'm in my, like, 40s and going, oh. <laughs> true story, true story. So let's talk about life after God. Just, you know, small topic. How do your lives look different now as opposed to when you first walked away? Bart. Nah, John, John, that's the thing. Uh, one thing that my life looks like now is that I have this podcast that John produces and, and that John sometimes co-hosts with me on. And the thing is like, I do most of the talking. Like even when we have guests, I struggle not to do most of the talking. And oh, so- Oh, you mean with like, the guest? Yeah, yeah. I, I, just I, doing the guest, but you're- I interrupt you. guests and I'm <laughs> terrible. And so uh, this is so wonderful to, to be talking with you guys, partly because you've got John on the mic and you're treating us just the same. And so like, I'm like, yeah, John, how is your life different? Cause like, I'm interested, um, you know? It's funny guys too, for me, because I'm so used to, even in the rest of my job, I'm putting other people on camera, you know, and put, you know, put, putting other people in the spotlight, yeah, never myself. Asked a lot of questions. Yeah. And I, and I kind of, I'm comfortable like that, you know? Um, All right, then I'll answer. Yeah, please answer. No, I, I mean, for me, look, I'll, I'll just say for, for me, it's been a process of like figuring out what, what do ethics look like, you know, when you have to make them yourself to some extent. I'm not bar, you know, in other words, I'm, I'm trying to figure out a, a framework. And this has been, you know, 20 years now, but I think it's a very useful thing to have to think from first principles about all of the things that you believe, all the things, the way you're going to treat people, the way you're going to conduct your romantic relationships, your, your other relationships. It's a very interesting uh, thing. And I think it's been more exciting in a certain way than I get it from a pastor or I get it from the book. So for me, it's been, you know, I, I feel really good about building it to a certain extent using my own intellect to do it rather than what I felt like before was I was told what to believe and what to do. And I, I just much prefer it. I think it fits me quite well. Like I enjoy that process of figuring out like, well, what would you tell this friend that, you know, has this dilemma in their life and there's not an immediate answer from God. To me, it's a good exercise. So 
Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think Bart, you, you, you and I are are quite different in the way that we've handled those things, and also in the way that, first of all, there was always more scrutiny on you, like what you did and said and believed and how you acted and think. They were it was more in the spotlight, right? But I, I was the other thing is, I wasn't just a Christian. I was a to the bone evangelist. You know, like I I won people to the faith. I brought people into the community. I went out on the streets and tried to get drug dealers to give their lives to Jesus. And and the weird thing is, is that the way my life changed after Christianity is actually so much less significant than the way my life changed when I was 15 and I got into Christianity. Hmm. Because like, I was just a nice kid, you know, and and my parents were like, I was around Christianity, but I mean, I literally this, this, a buddy of mine in high school took me to this youth group and I fell in with these people. And I was like, oh my gosh, these guys are serious evangelical Christians. Like they are, like they're a movement. They're trying to change the lives of other people. And, you know, for a nice kid like me, this was like this group of wonderful people that were like, we love everybody and we're going to go find sad and lonely people and bring them in and, and, and make their lives better. And I was like, I am in, I am in. And what appealed to me about Christianity was not going to heaven, was not the crazy ass narrative. That was always the hard part for me. What appealed to me about Christianity was the mission. And so I, I bought into that. And I mean, I went all, I went as hard as you could. And ultimately, because I was so excited about being part of a community that loved people, I ended up loving a lot of people that their life stories and their experiences are what talked me into the idea that Christianity doesn't really work. But when I left Christianity, I was like, okay, my values are exactly the same. I remember my wife saying to me, she's like, okay, so don't believe in God anymore, right? She's like, do you want to stay married? I was like, of course I want to stay married. She's like, okay, I was just checking because there's like no rule that says we have to, like there used to be. She's like, do you still love our kids? I was like, what are you talking about? She's like, do you still want to help poor people? And, and like, she was yanking my chain, but what she was trying to illustrate to me, she was like, you're the same guy. And I am so the same guy. Like, so, so she didn't say to you, do you want to stay married? And you said to her, yeah. And she went, oh, oh okay, me, me too. <laughs> 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 she did she did say me too which was looking back was a very good moment for me because it was a little scary when she asked <laughs> but like the i like that's the thing so you know, say how has it changed and the thing that changed was like the second i left christianity literally the second i finally accepted i'm done i was like okay now where do i find a community of people who want to love people and bring them into community and build community and help people work through things and fight for social justice of people that don't believe in God. Like where's the church for people who want to live for love in a secular way? Reddit. God. Well, I started going to atheist groups and, you know, a bunch of angry 50 year old guys with black t-shirts and Dawkins books under their arms going, you know, like who wanted to make fun of Christianity and and talk about how superior they were. And, And like, they weren't even nice people and they had no friends. And I was like, yeah, I, no, I don't want to be in that. And, and I, so I kept looking and I couldn't find it because the thing is, is that like, I was like, I still want to do all that stuff. And I still believe that like people have a hard time living a good life on their own. Like we, they, they, we're tribal species. And so eventually I ended up becoming a humanist chaplain because I met a humanist chaplain at Harvard who was running a youth group. You know, you joke about the pizza parties. I liked youth group. And so I, he was running basically a campus ministry except for secular kids. And they were going on missions trips and they were reading books and talking about how they could use the information in the books to be better friends and to be kinder people and to have better relationships. I was like, it, it was like Bible study, except that the books that they were reading were science books and psychology books and, 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 and news books. Like, and I was like, yeah, sign me up. I want to build communities of people that want to make the most of this life and that have figured out that the way to make the most of this life is by loving each other. Yeah, and you go like, well, gosh, Bart, the tone in your voice is a little bit triggering for me because you sound like a preacher. And I go like, I'm still a preacher. I just got a different gospel. And when we had you on our podcast last time. Yeah. Did people hate me? Well, no, you were still 
like, and, and I say still, because I, I don't know where you're at now, but you were still trying to build these communities and, and we were like, yeah. really, is that going to work? And so how, how did it all pan out? Are you still doing it or, or have you moved on from all that? Now the answer is yes, it works and no, it doesn't work. Yes, it works in the sense of you get a charismatic leader such as myself. Um, and I don't mean charismatic, like everybody wants to be my best friend, but like somebody who can articulate a vision. And you don't mean they speak in tongues. And I don't mean they speak in tongues. That's right. I just mean somebody who can articulate a vision and, and capture people's attention and get them to listen. And you articulate the vision that I just laid out for you. And there's a lot of post-Christians in particular who are just desperately lonely outside of church and they miss the music. They don't miss, I mean, they don't miss hating gay people and they don't miss believing that God has a purpose for a nine-year-old kid who gets killed in a car accident. They don't, they don't miss the nonsense, but they, they, they miss the music. They miss the cover to suppers. They miss the mission trips. They miss being part of an intergenerational community where they know older people and, and, they, and they can be involved in other people's kids. They miss all that beautiful stuff. And so you, you say to them, hey, I want to build one of those except for people who don't believe that narrative. And they go like, oh, sign me up. The difficulty is, is that the churches that we grew up in they had economic engines that were based on tithing and based on, you know, larger institutions and, and property and things like that. And when you start from scratch, you don't have anybody like planting your church. And it takes a lot of energy and a lot of time to put that together. And so at the beginning, I tried to do it in like on my savings, but I ran out of money and I had to get a job. And once you have to get a job, it's really hard to pastor a congregation especially when the people that come generally are the neediest bunch. They're the people that got the hurt, hurt the worst and they're the loneliest and they're the saddest. People like John don't come to a thing like mine in general. Like they're, they're like, I made friends. I got, you know, like I got a relationship. I'm fine. You know? And so I read books. Um, and so, yeah. So we, right before COVID hit me and a bunch of my friends here in Cincinnati, cause I had left USC cause I couldn't afford to live in LA and my wife hated it there. We moved back to Cincinnati and I, I was trying to figure out what to do next. And I was, you know, you know, but all these people that have listened to my podcast in Cincinnati were like, Hey, you're in Cincinnati now. Can we come? And so I started holding dinners and it turned into a congregation and it was growing and it was beautiful. Every other week we would meet. It's called caravan. So great. Um, and COVID hit and it just wiped us out. Like when we couldn't meet together in person, the whole thing fell apart. And by the time COVID was over, all my leaders, like they'd gone to nursing school or they, they were working jobs and nobody had the energy. We, and we were all wiped out by COVID emotionally, trying to hold people together during that time. And so we, the, the congregation didn't re-coalesce. And like, I ache about that to this day. And I am still plotting. Like if, if, if the MacArthur Foundation ever gives me a genius grant, which they never will, because I'm not, but if they ever did, what I would do is I would go back and I would, I would reconstitute a local community around those principles because I'm convinced that 50 years from now, if, if, the, if our species makes it that long, there will be lots of secular congregations. I mean, it pops up all over the place. People trying to figure out like, how can we have friends? How can we inspire each other to good works? How can we hold it together? How can we teach our kids our values? Like good people are always going to figure out like, you know, you really can't do this just with a nuclear family. You need some support. And, and so like, I still believe in it. I know a lot about how to do it, but I got to tell you, especially in the early days, it takes a lot of investment and I'm, I'm an old guy and my wife is tired of working with me on projects that I'm trying to dream up from scratch. I wore her out over 60 years. And so like, yeah, I've got the vision. I, I, I don't have the, I don't have the means. I'm sorry. Did I ramble on? I think I did. That's fine. I, and um, look, I think it's on the, the theme of, you know, belonging. I mean, we all want something to belong to. We still want meaning. It doesn't matter what it what it is. We want something, and I think that's why we have a loneliness epidemic as well. People want to connect. Yeah. They want to have similarity. And, and, and Brian, yeah, it was funny. It's like people go, like, I can have as much meaning. Like, I I can do it on my and, and like the thing about meaning is meaning is another word for mattering, and you can only mean something in a relationship. There has to be somebody that you matter to. And there has to be somebody that matters to you. So like it is a relational value. And so the idea that you could live a meaningful life without being significantly connected to other people, that's just 
bad science. Like that's just not how human brains work. That's not how we're wired up. And so as a counselor, I meet all these people that are trying to find meaning and they're also trying to find an intimate relationship. Like they want to have one partner that's going to provide all the love for them. And like it puts a ridiculous amount of pressure on their relationships and most of them don't make it. And it's not how meaning works. Like, you know, like couples don't exist very well unless they're surrounded by other people and other relationships that sort of fill in the blanks. No one person can be your whole village. So, yeah, like, do I sound like I'm on a soapbox? It's because like when you say to me, how is my life different? My life is really different in ways I wish it wasn't. I wish I was just the fucking pastor of a fucking humanist congregation. And I could get up and preach sermons like I used to preach at Caravan, which was our little community that weren't like didactic and stuff like that. But they were they were reflections on how do you make the most of this life by cultivating loving relationships and by doing work that matters for other people and by cultivating a sense of wonder and gratitude for the privilege of human consciousness. And I love that. I loved doing that. And it, it pains me that I don't get to do it anymore. And being a counselor is not the same thing at all. And my sense is, Bart, that you, you think that some of this could be done. Like, in other words, the connecting thing, the living life together thing, that could be done in, in neighborhoods or in pickleball teams and things like that. And it's kind of like, but you, you still think, my sense is you still think there's something missing in that. Like, in other words, it does maybe a lot of the heavy lifting because it provides community or it can in the best case scenario, but you think that like there's this extra level that church did. And you know what, John, to be honest with you, like the, the thing that, you know, and, and, and again, Brian, to your question about like what changed, I left Christianity, like my supernatural credulity was gone for like five or eight years before my fundamentalism was gone. You asked me if I was a fundamentalist. And what I mean is, is that when I left Christianity, I started looking for the one true path to make a live a meaningful life outside of Christianity. And I was convinced it had to do, John, with mm -hmm. some kind of, you know, organized community or something like that. It took me a long time to realize, like, some people need those kind of communities. Other people don't. Some people have a, a high, you know, need to be involved in this. Some people need to be involved. Some people, this kind of thing is going to move them. Other people, it's going to leave them cold. So I'm not saying that everybody needs that, John. Right. In the bell curve, man, there's a lot of people. Right. But church is a, if you reverse engineer it, it's a bunch of things. It's a community piece. It's also like TED Talks. It's also like. Live music. Yeah, yeah. Live music. And you can maybe get those things in different places, but what you're talking about is there is sort of a thing of like, if these are all people that believe roughly the same, you know, like they're, they're humanists on some level, they are maybe post, post Christian or something like that. I guess I've never really become convinced either way on that question. That's why I'm interested in it. Like, I, I don't really know what I think on that, but I think it's interesting. When the other thing is like in that bell curve, a lot of people in the middle, they're religious by nature. And I don't mean supernatural credulity religious. I mean, they, they want to make sense of their individual lives and make their ethical decisions in relationship to a larger narrative. Like this is where we come from. This is what happens when we die. This is what makes life meaningful. This is why the world is the way it is. This is why I am the way I am. And sure, Christianity or Islam or any of those religions did that. But what these people... Like, like if you're religious by nature, like me, like I want to have not, I don't really want to just do good things. I want to know why I want to do them. And I want to know why it makes sense. And I want to know that when I die, that like I'm connected to something bigger than myself, that like I'm leaving something better than I found or whatever. And so what, what people need, why people need religious communities, even if they're secular religious communities, is to spin a narrative that says, oh. Those existential questions, yeah, we work on those together. And this is where I think we come from. And this is what it means to be human. And this is why it's right to do this and why it's not right. And you don't, like, there doesn't have to just be one because, like, you're making it up. But the idea is, like, I need that. So, like, when I watch Carl Sagan or listen to Neil deGrasse Tyson and when they, you know, or when I read evolutionary biology and I understand, like, where my impulse to love my children comes from, and they go like, oh, you've taken all the mystery out of it because like it's all just a matter of chemicals and science and evolution. I'm like, nah, 
doesn't spoil it for me at all. Right. Right. I, I love, I love that narrative, but I need to like, I need a narrative and I need to talk about it. Yeah. And yeah. those are the people that want to be in a tribe that sits around the campfire and sings the songs together and says, we believe this and we think this, these are our values that we share and we're going to teach into our children. And, and, and you don't have to look very far to see that we're not like, as these social institutions are eroding, I was talking to a guy from the Pew research, you know, group. He was like, listen, I don't believe in God either. But he said, you get, you know, if you care about the world, you should lament the demise of all these religious institutions because people are not going to do very well outside of them. Mm. So that was a question that I asked you when we had you on last time and no offense, Bart, but I didn't feel you gave me a really good answer. And that is this Ooh. thing about narrative, right? And so when you think about Judaism, right? We are an oppressed people. We were together in Egypt and Moses rose up and, you know, and on and on we go. Christianity, you know, we had this Messiah who was crucified. There's a storytelling to that narrative. There's, there's something, you know, whether it's actually historical or whether it's mythological or whether it's a combination, even, you know, we, we've had some, some guests on our podcast who came out of Keith Green's commune right which which they're now saying is a cult right and they're both saying you know he arranged my marriage and all this kind of stuff but there was still wow. this charismatic leader as well and i'm not saying this in in, in a way of you know throwing it back at you but Go ahead, sounds man. to me like you're pining for the 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 community and 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 sort of what you've lost and you're trying to recreate that and hold that without the narrative you know, without a central narrative. And so I sort of want to throw it back to you and say, how, how is this going to work without all the, with all the bullshit? The truth is like, I don't need this. I make friends easily. I got like, I, you know, I got people waiting on me tonight. Like I, you know, like my wife and I have a whole community around us. Like, I don't need this. I didn't need it then. I liked throwing the party for other people. I can always throw a party for myself. Like I'm not pining. Like I I'm happy to sleep in on Sunday mornings, but I see, a, you know, I see a gaping need in our culture. Okay. So that's the first thing. Second thing is narrative. You say, how can you build something like that without a narrative? You can't. And that's why, like, I believe that science, if somebody would figure out how to tell the story better, like every now and then I meet somebody like Hank green, or, uh, you know, or, uh, Ursula Goodenough or Carl Sagan, who tells the story of how things are in a way that makes me want to be a better person. And I think like there's a narrative that says, hey, kids, hey, 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 my little five year old granddaughter. In the beginning, there was matter and energy, big bang, and there was no meaning and there was no love in the universe because there was nobody to love and there was no nobody to, to matter to. And then like this single celled organism. And I don't even, I can't even tell you exactly how the first one got started, but I can tell you about how the matter and energy formed into planets and all that stuff. But then like the first single celled organism, and maybe there were lots of them and they didn't make it because they didn't want to live. But the first thing that ever happened that really mattered was when the first single celled organism emerged that wanted to project itself forward and split and have a second single celled organism. And like when life that wanted to live came into the planet, like that's the first value the first thing that mattered was there was this living thing that wanted to live and it wanted to produce more of itself it wanted to produce more life it wanted to project itself into the future and all these different strategies grew out of that all these animals evolved and like you know charles darwin and all that stuff but like in the end there were all these different strategies but this this one set of organisms had this strategy the, the, these mammals and their strategy was that they would care about each other like their strategy was to cooperate. Their strategy was to nurture their children and not eat them. And they would nurture them and protect them together. And that way they could have kids with bigger brains and the bigger brains would enable them to be able to build better relationships and the better relationships would enable them to, to figure out stuff. And, 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 and so love emerged out of nothing, out of life. For a long time, there was just life. And then there was love as a strategy. And we grew out of that. We, we, we're down the road on that thing. 
And there are a lot of ways, there are a lot of strategies to stay alive, but ours is love. That's, that's how we do it. That's how we make it. And, and the reason you need to share with your brother is because as a human being, you're hardwired that like if you share with your brother, it'll keep you safe and it'll keep him safe, but also it will feel good to you. Like I'm not telling you to share because God tells you to share. I'm telling you to share because I know how you work and your life will be better and you will live longer and you will thrive if you learn to love. Now, like Troy, that might not move you. That might not move a lot of people, but, but it moves me and it moves a lot of people that I preach it to. It's moving me down the aisle towards the altar, baby. Come forward. Come give your life. You know? <laughs> and, and, and so, but like in the end, I have a narrative to say to a kid like, and the good news about my narrative is if he opens up a book or if there's a new scientific discovery, it won't blow it out of the water. It'll just make it better. Like, like you don't have, you don't have to be afraid. And, and if, and if a part of it's wrong, you just change and, you, and science proves it. You just change your mind. But the truth that matters, it's a narrative that's asking this important question. Where did I come from? What should I do? And what makes something right? And what makes something wrong? You know, in the end, what makes something right to me is if it causes life to go forward. And what makes something wrong is if it destroys life. And like, that's, that's not just something I made up. Like that's in my bones. Like I feel wrong when I eat something that's going to kill me. Like it's true. Like I am wired to stay alive and not, and, and not just to love my own life, but I'm why I'll give up my life to, to save my kids or my cousins or my nephew. Like I'm in love with life. I'm committed to life. And, and, and love is a subset of that for me. What, like love is like, I figured out like, you know what? There's a lot of different ways to try to take care of a human. They, they tend to, they tend to do better with love. So I was in a hamburger place yesterday. Not only did I eat pizza, I ate hamburgers and the same day, which doesn't usually happen. And Brian, you would be happy to hear this family came in dressed in Richmond football club outfits, the whole family, mother, father, kids, uncles, aunties, everybody was dressed in this, in this Richmond football club gear. But here's the thing, right? They were together. They had a narrative and the narrative is just as meaningless as Christianity, right? It's a football team, right? And yet it's pulling them together and they are coming together around this football team and they're going out for lunch and doing like, I understand where you're coming from because I miss it too. And I would love to have that sort of community, but I find that people are ready to come around the karate club or come around their football teams or come around, you know, a, a band or a concert or whatever it is, or they, you know, they dress up as furries or they, th there's a whole heap of narratives that are pulling people together. And, and I hear exactly what you're saying. So it's not that it doesn't move me. I just look at it and I go, except for those of us that have tasted this kind of stuff, being religion, you know, whether it's, you know, Judaism or Buddhism or whatever, people tend to find a narrative that can be just as empty or just as untrue is the better word I'm looking for as what we found in Christianity. And this is why they're not gravitating to what you're selling because they've got it elsewhere. And they don't necessarily understand about, you know, what you're saying about love and all that kind of stuff, but they are actually living it. Does that make sense? It does. It just, just doesn't line up with my experience. Like when I was at USC on, on this college campus with all these bright, privileged, wonderful kids, they were getting great jobs. They were handsome. They were great athletes. They were all these things. A lot of them were lonely. They, they knew how to get laid, but they had never held hands with anybody. They knew how to party, but they didn't have any friends that they really felt like would be there for them if they were, if, if they were in trouble or that they felt like they could talk to about the real things in their lives. And so like, yeah, I see people like they, they love to go to the sports games. I, I, I'll be watching Leeds United tomorrow morning. Like I, I, I'm a big follower of Leeds, but like that community can't do for me what most people need when the chips are down or, or will need at some point. Or we'll need at some point when they're dying. I, I hear you. I hear you. But the picture that I painted then was not some people watching 
football on television, they were all dressed up. They were going down to, you know, Carl's Jr. And they were sitting together. Or, or when I go to Comic-Con here in Australia, which, by the way, it should be called Tragic-Con. It's not, not any good. But you go there <laughs> and you've got all these kids dressed up in their outfits and they're, and they're together and they've got something that it's appealing to them that's drawing them together. And then they do have community and now now please and if that's what and if that's working for them i'm thrilled yeah yeah, yeah. exactly exactly like i i got nothing against it but there's got to be something do, do you remember in church we had this story that god loves you and has a plan for you and and all this and and it was it was myth i get it and but so too with with you know jewish communities when they get together right you know we, we are an oppressed people and this is who we are there's there's this thing that brings them first and then they build the community around that and and I hear you saying with this, you know, the the problem with science, right, is ultimately there is no meaning because nobody knows, and so ultimately you go, Meh, okay, science isn't the, the the religion; it's it's the tool. Like in the end, I don't have to talk anybody into wanting to belong. I don't have to talk a soul into it. I don't have to talk anybody into that it feels good to make a difference in a life of another person. Like, it's just like you come out of the womb with that shit. That's just your hard wiring as a mammal. Like elephants grieve their young, like bonobos forgive each other. Like I don't have to sell any of it, bro. It's all right there. Yeah, yeah, and, and I get that, but I, I get that. And, and please don't hear me saying, you know, this, this isn't true, but I just wonder, is this more a message that needs to be injected into existing communities from the outside rather than being a central narrative to build a community around? Both and, both and. And the reason I say all that is because my experience, I mean, gosh, I left church in, in 99. I haven't seen any of these post-Christian groups last, whether it's the Sunday thing, whether right. it's- Sunday assembly, Oasis, they all fall. Exactly. And, and, I can, and, and I can tell you why I think they fall. Like that would be a whole other podcast of like what it takes to make them last. So I'm not, I'm not pushing against what you're trying no. to do and saying it's not valuable. It totally is. But it may just not be realistic. Yeah, exactly. It's just like, you know what? I think once we've walked away from all this, it's it's time to reintegrate into society, warts and all. And I don't think we can bring this with us unless we go and start a cult, right? And we could start a cult and and you know, I, I I'm charismatic, you know, I, I I could start a cult. I know I could, but that's not the right thing to do. <laughs> you know, every time somebody starts a, a theater company. They're starting a cult. Every time somebody starts an elementary school, they're starting a cult. Every time somebody starts a company, they're starting a cult. Like, or they could be. Like a restaurant can be this. Like a, a soccer team can be this. I sometimes joke with my fiance, like we're in a cult of two, you know, like you're creating <laughs> yeah. a little culture. You're part of something that you're w with values. And, and maybe, maybe Troy, the best way to say, like maybe what I, what I hear you saying is, we don't need one brand that we go like, this is the brand. What we need is like the quality and sort of go like every group, like, like every group on a college campus, whether it's the soccer team or the knitting club or the math society should know how to create a sense of belonging, should have a sense of like, how do you build some camaraderie, should understand how human beings work and, and what it takes like how to, how to resolve conflict because you're never going to have a community that's going to last very long without conflict. So you got to learn how to, resolve. and you just go like, maybe, you know, and this is where my therapist brain comes in and go like, yeah, there's so many people out there that don't know how to do the thing that they want. They want to be a part of a certain kind of relationship and they want to be part of a certain kind of community, but they don't know what it takes to make that kind of community go. And so it, it isn't just those secular communities that don't make it. It's a lot of restaurants don't make it. It's a lot of companies that don't make it. It's a lot of, it's a lot of uh, theater companies that fall apart. Like groups fall apart all the time because people don't know how to hold a tribe together. And, and I go like, yeah, I think you're right. I think throughout our society, we need to be, we need to figure out like, what can I do to help people become better at creating the villages that people need to thrive? But anybody that tells me that people are going to thrive 
on YouTube videos and virtual reality and online relationships and social media, pay attention, wake up and smell the coffee. That shit ain't going to work for humanity. Yeah, totally, totally. And that's what I was about to say. When you say that, that to me is, is awesomeness, right? And let's make something really clear. Brian and I love your podcast, right? So we, we, we have, and we are, we're regular listeners, listeners, we're fans. So we wanted to have you on here to talk about what works, what works with life after church? You know, what have you seen? What have you seen evolve? What, what, what have you seen lasts? And, and also what, what didn't work? And I think your, your message and your message of your podcast is how do we move forward? You know, how do we look towards making the world a better place? And, and I kind of laugh sometimes when I listen to you guys, especially you, Bart, when you um, basically still have this end of the world mentality, right? That I think you brought from oh, church. Oh yeah, I'm the most yeah. pessimistic person you'll ever meet. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is, <laughs> which is hilarious because then at the same time, you're, it reminds me, and I don't say this to disparage you, I promise, but it's, it reminds me of church. It's like the world is ending and here's a message of hope. Right, you, you you still do that, man. You still do that, and I catch myself too. Right, I still catch myself doing that as well. So again, not not throwing shade at you. And, and so he, he, you know, you said to me like, "What's the one? What's the thing that works on the other side of faith?" It's that a lot of times when people leave the faith, they walk away from everything, or they they become nihilistic. They don't think there's is there any meaning. The one thing I'm always selling is not community, not not like organizing. It's not narratives. The one thing I'm always selling is relationships. That's the one thing I'm always selling. I'm sort of saying like, listen, if you leave the faith, you want to know what works? What works is to commit yourself to learning how to build better relationships. And the church in some ways and lots of the college in some ways makes people that don't know how to build relationships. Even, even people that know nothing about relationships can make friends in college. Because it's like they set it up. They pick people who are exactly like you and you all live right together. You eat together. It's like, it's like a youth retreat that lasts for four years. But in the end, most of the people that I know and most of the people that come to me in my practice as a counselor, they know that they needed to learn how to drive a car. They know that nobody is born knowing how to play the guitar. They know that brain surgery requires years of training. But they think having a good marriage or being a good parent or being a good friend they think that everybody should just instinctively know how to do that. And so the one true gospel that I actually have to share, the one thing I know works on the other side of faith is you got to commit yourself to learning how to build those relationships. And you go like, wait, I mean, there aren't books you can read. Sure there are. There aren't TED Talks you can watch. Yeah, of course. There aren't people that can teach you. Sure there are. And most people I know, like they think like, they should know. And they beat themselves up for not having friends. And they go like, what's wrong with me? And the answer is like, if you've never been around those kind of relationships and nobody's ever sat down and taught you how to build those kind of relationships, how the hell would you know? And so the one thing I say is like, listen, if I told you your whole life depended on being better at archery, you would know what to do. Even if you'd never picked up a bow and arrow in your life, you would, you would look it up online, you would get some lessons, you would practice, you would get books, you would hang around with other archers, you'd join an archery club. And I go, your life doesn't depend on being a good archer. But your life does depend on building loving relationships. That much I will take to the bank. And so I'm just like, if somebody said to me like, hey, I just left Christianity, I, you got five minutes, can you tell me one thing I should do? I go like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Make learning how to build relationships and processing the shit that keeps you from building relationships. Make that your top priority because if you can learn how to build relationships, you'll be fine. And if you can't, no matter how good everything else, no matter how much money you make, no matter how many women you lay, no matter how many ideas you can, you can grok, your life will not thrive. It's all about relationships. One of the things that I picked up, I'm going to say this and we may have to edit this, but one of the things that I picked up after leaving church, the key to success was don't be a cunt, right? Because in essence, you can walk away from church and just think all of that is bullshit. And I had to go and work out how to live in a way where I wasn't an asshole. And church gave me that. Church gave me these boundaries, right? And 
I think before, and, and I think it's tied to what you're saying, but I think a lot of people throw it all out and then they have to learn the hard way, or well, at least I did, about how to- Yeah, you're saying the same thing. You know, how to, how to stop being an yeah. asshole. And, and I think that is, that's the relationship thing. And that's what happened to me when I re-engaged with religious communities, but not as a religious person myself. There was this reminder to be kind, to be generous, to be loving. And I realized I'd lost that. And I'd lost that in my years in air quotes of the wilderness. And so in that, I, I relate to you, but I think injecting that into the football club, injecting that into schools, injecting that into the university, you know, these things that are already pulling people together. Existing social structures. Yeah. That's the only thing I'm pushing back against. I'm saying, I think you are hundred percent right. And that's why I love your podcast. Right. And that's why in terms of moving forward, let's get John and Bart on a hundred percent. But I'm thinking this idea of pulling people together. I've done this for, you know, 20 something years and I just haven't seen it work, Bart. I just haven't seen it work. And I think we got to get, I think if we're going to instruct people on how to live post church, it's be a good person, build relationships, be loving, be kind, all the stuff that religion was supposed to be telling us to do but do it where you are. I hear you. And I'm, I'm with you. The problem with injecting it into the football club is it's hard work to inject it into the football club and you'll get discouraged. And so you need to go to a bunch of other people that are also trying to inject it into their football clubs and commiserate and plot strategy and remind each other that yeah, you're you not crazy. You need to create a para football club organization. Yeah. Right. Instead of church. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll say one other thing. Um, first of all, you know, you, how not to be a cunt. One thing is like, don't dominate a conversation for an hour and then say, I've got to go before you let anybody else respond, <laughs> but I got to go. I'm five minutes past my hard stop. Second thing I'll say is I live in Ohio, which doesn't mean anything to you guys, but, uh, in Ohio that is where Orville and, uh, Wilbur Wright, um, basically invented the first airplane. And for 20 years, people had been trying to get those things off the ground and they just didn't work. And they just didn't work until they did. And so like, I hear you. They haven't worked yet. And I'm going to keep trying. I got to go. I got to go. Love you guys. Love, love what you do. Love you guys. We, we need a part two, which we will schedule down the track because I do think we need to explore this stuff more. Um, completely resonate with both what you and Troy are saying, Bart. Um, I, I think that there's just so much more for us to unpack and discover in this space. In short, we need community. We need each other. We need love to do, to do, to do. So thank you, Bart. And thank you, John. It's been a great episode and we're sort of leaving it at a bit of a full stop, but wait, in a few months, we'll be back with another episode. And I said cunt for the first time on our <laughs> podcast, by the way, I, I hope we leave that in. I really want to leave that in, but Brian's probably going to want to cut it out. No, you can. You can leave it. Bart did it as well, and you can, which just lends to the fact that Bart will never be a pastor again, but whatever. <laughs> um, but <laughs> I got to go. I love you guys. All right. Bye, Bart. Right. Love you too, mate. Bye. Thanks, guys, so much. No, thank you, John. And I do think we'll have to get you guys back on. Absolutely. Any, any time. We can, we can work that out. It'd be great because we're continuing to unpack all this stuff, so it'd be amazing. Yeah, yeah and, and yeah. next time we'll get you to talk too, John. It'll be good. <laughs> I'm very happy, very happy the way it was. Yeah. Thanks, guys, so much. Thanks, John. If you'd like to connect with the I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist podcast, then please see the links in our link tree in the show notes. We invite you to join our listener community on Facebook, and we're also on Instagram, X, and Reddit. Check out our merch on Redbubble. We've got T-shirts, hoodies, mugs, and all kinds of great evangelical stuff that you can wear proudly. All proceeds go to building and promoting the podcast. We want to give a huge shout out to our Patreon supporters. Subscribers get a range of benefits, including free merch, early access to episodes, access to our exclusive subscribers group, and monthly bonus content. Again, all proceeds of this go to the running and promotion costs of the podcast. A special thanks to Arva, who manages our social strategy, and also to Kerry and Bree, who manage our Facebook listener group, and also to Bree, who puts out our monthly newsletter on Substack. All of our episodes are transcribed by Leanne to increase accessibility. 
The show is produced and hosted by Brian McDowell and Troy Waller. The sound engineering for this episode was done by Jonathan O'Brien. I Was a Teenage Fundamentalist is available wherever you find your podcasts. Again, you can find all our links in our link tree in the show notes. Or why don't you pop across to our website at www.iwasateenagefundamentalist.com. 